Um, I shall introduce our first speaker tonight, uh, Brigadier Mark Overton. Now, Mark uh, has been in the Army Reserves uh, for approximately 25 years, um, but also uh, we need to say to him congratulations because it was recently announced that he is going to become the Assistant Chief of the Defence Staff for Reserves and Cadets in the uh, rank of Major General. And uh, as you'll see in a minute, uh, to quote uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, it looks like he's a very modern Major General. So Mark's experience in the reserve includes working with the signals, um, the infantry, infantry, should I say, um, training, uh, including part of the Sandhurst staff. Um, he was the commanding officer of the London Regiment. He's worked in army headquarters and as a brigadier has been involved in recruiting. Um, he did the army reserve input to the, the recent integrated review and he's also been advising on digital transformation uh, in the army. And the reason for that is, as well as his uh, uh, very busy career as a reserve officer in the army, he's also been widely involved in IT and is currently the chief solutions officer uh, for Sierra Wireless, who are a leader in provision of the Internet of Things. And finally, Mark has also recently joined the Worshipful Company of Information Technologists. So, Mark, over to you. Will, do you want to kick off the presentation before I start? Well, good evening. And um, uh, I just uh, add my own thanks, um, Jeff, actually here, um, especially to the Worshipful Company, to Kimball Bailey for introducing me to the company, um, and to Kushru uh, and yourself, Jeff, uh, and Melissa for setting this up. I'd like to thank also Paul Jagger, who can't make it this evening, for his helpful insights and advice. And of course, my thanks goes to Mark um, uh, for his um, friendly uh, collaboration and support. So thanks to everybody. Um, so um, the digital soldier then. Well, um, technology and digitization in particular, and the availability of accurate and detailed information have apparently combined to create a new paradigm of warfare with governments able to force um, to focus force from over the horizon, reducing the need for boots on the ground. Yet military operations in Syria, the Arabian Gulf, and most recently in Afghanistan have had mixed outcomes, calling into question the UK's ability to project force effectively. Now it's clear that there have been some poor decisions and that we must learn from them. So what um, uh, Mark and I intend to do this evening is explain how the uh, Ministry of Defence's digitisation strategy is intended to improve the quality and timeliness of politico-military decision making. Now, my German friend always says, first of all, define your terms. So um, digitisation. Now, digitisation could be considered merely as a process, and it has been growing since the 1950s. Now, digitization affects every part of our lives. Now, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has accelerated the pace of transformation around the globe. Digitization is fundamentally about data and information, making the right information available to the right people at the right time and in the right format. Now, vast amounts of personal and other data can be gathered, and this has already led to strategic level struggle uh, between the United States and China uh, in order to get the best information. So the way we've addressed this is that Mark and I uh, have structured our approach as follows. Um, Mark uh, has a pressing uh, follow-on engagement this evening, so he'll first outline the uh, Ministry of Defence's digital strategy and programme. I will then talk about the nature and character of contemporary warfare, offer some final thoughts, and then try to answer your questions. So um, here, Jeff, I'll, I'll pause and uh, hand over to Mark. Thank you. That's great, Will. If I can have the next slide, please. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members of the uh, Worshipful Company, it's fantastic to be here. This is my first um, outing uh, in engagement with the Worshipful Company of Information Technologists. And actually, uh, you know, um, the person who sponsored me, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Histed, is actually online, which is great. Thank you, Chris. I'm, the reason I'm here is because of you. Um, but he was also very closely involved in um, some of the early thinking around the um, digital transformation of the British Army that I've been involved in. 
Um, I would also, also like to uh, thank Sir Ken Elisa, who's the president of uh, the Greater London Reserve Forces and Cadets Association, and that organisation I'm representing tonight at uh, the Greater London Reserve Forces and Cadets Association um, Silver Awards Dinner for Employers to, to Employers to Defence. So I'm sitting here in the RAF Club um, in one of their rooms prior to going on to welcoming uh, 50 employers who have been awarded that, um, that, that award, which is great. So I'm sorry I couldn't uh, be at the, the hall tonight. Um, just in terms of, uh, by way of adding some context, so as a reserve officer, uh, I was asked by uh, the Assistant Chief of the General Staff um, what I do in my um, civilian life. As I, he sort of said to me, I sort of understand what you do in your military uh, life. What do you do in civilian life? And I said, well, I run a global technology uh, business that specializes in the Internet of Things. Um, that was about 18 months ago. And he said to me, um, I'd like you to go and uh, meet with the Deputy Chief of the General Staff who is the digital champion for the army. And uh, we have want to put together a program that really gets after the, uh, the you know, formal and methodical way, the digital transformation of the British army. So that's what I've been doing, using a lot of reserve um, experts, um, those in uniform who care deeply about the organization and add a huge amount of insight and knowledge and advice um, uh, from their uh, civilian employment. So a, a great use of reservist uh, knowledge, skills and experience. So what's happening at the moment in defense, um, uh, the enterprise that we're, we're coordinating with and plugging into is significant. Um, uh, hopes, sponsored and, uh, and championed by Strategic Command, there is a very vibrant and uh, all-encompassing digital strategy for defense that's built primarily on what is called the digital backbone that connects people, process, data, and technology uh, together uh, to modernize and digitize our armed forces. The, if you want to go online, the, it's uh, type in digital strategy for defense. It's on uh, freely available. It is actually a very good read and it's uh, a good signpost uh, to what is happening. But this is sponsored um, into the strategic command by an organization called Defense Digital that is led by a three star called Charlie Forte. And he comes from industry and uh, his team of mixture of civilians, um, military and uh, reservists are looking uh, and working hard to transform defense. So that's going on at an enterprise level. Next slide, please. The reason it's doing this is to get after the multi-domain integration, which is absolutely fundamental to how we operate uh, as an enterprise, but also how we fight. Um, a multi-domain integration uh, is, is really about all the domains, land, sea, air, space, um, cyber, coming together um, and being closely coordinated by the troops and commanders on the ground to ensure that they have the right information where they need it to make the right decisions faster than their adversaries in order to accelerate decision making and uh, be successful. This is now a very sort of important call to arms for us across the services working into the fence that we start to coordinate our data, our architectures, our digital uh, behavior so that we can offer and uh, really get after that multi-domain integration. Now, in the case of the, the land component, next slide, please, which is the army, um, this really means about integrating our soldiers and their vehicles, um, as, as sensors extracting our information real time, uh, calculating and using the information at the edge uh, so that only the information that's really valuable and needed gets processed and pushed further into uh, the, the cloud and into the application layer. But that information um, is uh, you know, sort of taking that, that sensor based information from the soldiers, from the equipment back into uh, the, the, the organization to be processed is absolutely fundamental. Um, headquarters are more mobile than ever before. And, uh, you know, looking at uh, putting uh, headquarters into far-flung parts of the world, you know, the communications and data requirements to enable that to happen are significant. And they need to take into account the physics and challenges of the land environment. And it's not just in remote places, but especially in environments that uh, like urban. And as Will said, um, it is absolutely a critical part, the digital 
um, uh, backbone, a digital network is a critical part of your competitive fighting power. So ensuring the, uh, the, you can communicate um, in, the, in these challenging environments is absolutely essential. So Integrated Force 2025, um, focusing a lot on the digital backbone, modernizing and upgrading the platforms, turning these platforms into communication hubs and digital hubs that can be um, used in a variety of scenarios and use cases. Networking the I-Star piece, information security, um, tactical uh, pers perspective um, to actually ensure that you've got that um, complete picture of what's going on. And again, it's that multi-domain integration. It's secure um, and it's also not just for operations, it's, it's how we train to fight, we use it uh, and we deploy it in our training and it's embedded right from the start in the way we train our uh, new soldiers and uh, you know, continue with professional development throughout. One thing I am very seized on is the uh, talent management and digital skills that we need as an organization in the army to uh, force, uh, integrated force. Um, going forward are very different to the skills we've needed before. So making sure that the um, soldiers, the commanders, the leaders are trained in digital skills is, is absolutely paramount. And next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about the program approach that we've adopted. Um, next slide, please. So Project Thea. Thea is a goddess of Greek goddess of light. Um, and it's about the digital transformation of the British Army. It was stood up, um, as I said, about 18 months ago. It reports to the executive committee, the Army that is chaired by the Deputy Chief of the General Staff, and it meets uh, four times a year. And they dedicate about three to four hours of their ex time to this. So it's seriously getting the leadership and top-down focus it needs uh, to coordinate um, you know, across all functions uh, to ensure that uh, it is embedded in, in, and accelerated. Next slide, please. So why are we doing it this way around? Well, it is a program, and it's a program because um, there's a lot of good work going on uh, within the various functions, various disciplines, um, but they aren't as coordinated and coherent, and they're not as integrated as they need to be. Now, for those you know, on this call who are experts in information systems. And uh, this is, uh, it, you know, it's a major systems integration job. Um, and the army is more siloed than most organizations. It is a complex uh, multidimensional uh, organization, similar to large, other large complex multidimensional organizations, but it's extreme in its silos. Um, and the command and control uh, culture uh, that uh, is so effective uh, in times of crisis, but in when you're looking at a horizontal enabler like digital, you know, we need to break down the silos. We need to change that culture. And one of the ways we're doing this is, uh, is a change in the army operating model in the headquarters. So we've uh, revised that at the same time as launching a digital change program. So that's been a real accelerant. We, we need to communicate. Part of the digital change program, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, is the uh, need to communicate uh, to, to everyone what's going on, to get people excited, to evangelize about it, but also to get the various stakeholders to start taking the initiative, start thinking about what their role in the plan is and how do they help the army digitize. It can't just be top down, it needs to be bottom up, top down uh, and coordinated in the middle. Um, it's not just about being hyper competitive in the fight domain. It's also about capturing efficiencies and using efficiencies to invest uh, in uh, new technologies and to make the organization as efficient as possible. So in, from my world in, in the IoT space, dealing with large industrial enterprises, it's about as much efficiencies as it is about opportunities to sell more. Uh, in the army, it's about as much being competitive and winning against your adversaries as being efficient. So uh, efficiencies aren't necessarily make reducing uh, cost, it's maybe about doing things better to reallocate uh, and accelerate um, new initiatives elsewhere. And then finally, this is a multi-dimensional change program that covers the whole of the executive committee, the army, and it needs to be managed and orchestrated. So we put in a programmatic approach um, to, to do that. Next slide, please. So, this is a very busy slide, but it really does show, I think, picture paints a thousand words. It's one on a page 
that there's a need for change. Top left-hand corner, we all know what that is. We need to speed up decision making. Uh, we need to be able to compete, uh, you know, with um, with the other uh, um, assets that we have in a multi-domain integration environment. Um, we need to, you know, del deliver this on a federated basis. You can't control it all centrally, so it needs to be, you know, as much as possible pushed out to those who are expert in in the various areas and coordinated better, be it data sovereignty, data governance, architectural coherence, um, and, uh, and and coordination. As I mentioned, it's about outcompeting our adversaries, but it's also about improving our efficiencies. And finally, as this is uh, in, in any large um, IT program, uh, IS program, it's about integrating with partners, building a wider ecosystem of support with industry. And there's a big part of it it's about industry, but also our allies to ensure that interoperability. It's about culture change. And I mentioned this already, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that more in a second. You know, it's, if we don't get that right, um, then it doesn't matter how good the technology is and how good the strategy is, it, it's not going to work. And we're seeing a real change of culture and mindset. It's not just about Generation Z, you know, talking, uh, you know, what they can do on their iPhone they want to do in, uh, in, in uniform. It's much more nuanced than that. We're seeing this as very much part of, of how, who we are and how we operate. And I think that's very, very important. And uh, we're helping accelerate that with the... Uh, with the FIA program. On the bottom, you'll see that there are three elements to the program, which give it um, coherence and, uh, and, and work off each other. So we have accelerators. Um, so these are uh, areas that we want to shine a light on, um, uh, that uh, each um, functional lead owns at least one accelerator, where they're held to account by the executive committee to deliver that accelerator. And that, again, forces activity, it forces people to think differently, um, and it raises the profile of digital within that business area, within that functional area. The enablers are um, absolutely front and center. These are the most important pieces to ensure uh, future proofing, to ensure scalability and interoperability. This is the digital backbone, the architectures, the data coherence, you know, getting after these um, and, uh, you know, really putting in place the right level of governance and oversight to ensure that there are coherence. Now, meshing those together, um, you know, have, is, is, is critical. And that's what we need to also mesh into the defense element as well. So defense is the enterprise. We're a business unit. We need to plug into that and make sure that we can communicate backwards and forwards um, to ensure that multi-domain integration. And then there are catalysts. And those are really sort of areas of real focus, AI, ML being a Good example, uh, advanced analytics. You know the, the the stuff that everyone's wanting to get out of all this. Um, you know, hard work we're putting into those key enablers and those accelerators, but really bringing them all to life. And so the focus at the moment is starting to pull out some really exciting accelerators, some use cases where people can see the benefit of digital transformation, defining the enablers and rolling those out, and ensuring that architectural coherence. We've just stood up stood up in the army an army design authority in the, uh, in the army headquarters. This is now seen as pivotal to the way we do business. And this is a brand new capability that's staffed by professionals to cohere all the work across systems and processes and platforms to make sure they're coherent and accessible to everyone else. Um, and then catalysts, getting after the, the angel dust, the bits that's gonna make us different and win the battle against our adversaries and also be as hyper-efficient as possible. Next slide, please. So coming from industry, I was asked uh, to give some thoughts about, you know, what I see differently, what are my, uh, my observations? And I came up with these, uh, which I presented to the um, RUSI conference a couple of months ago, but I think they're still very relevant. Um, I think leadership is critical in any change program, especially digital transformation. Uh, we have significant defense alignment and it has army board focus and that's being driven um, by the deputy head of the army, uh, you know, as the digital champion and uh, he is using advisors like me to, to really change the way people are thinking about digital transformation. Um, coherence is key, you know, that data governance, um, getting an aligned operating model and cadence, uh, the army design authority, um, you know, that's where we need to get the right processes and procedures and coherence in place. And 
industry can certainly help. So we have a lot of contracts um, with uh, large technology companies. Um, again, they have an oversight of the whole of the defense estate um, where, where we need to leverage that because they, they, they see things in a different way to the individual services. So they can point out you know, where there's the coherence and where they can actually help provide that. And some of them have been really supportive in that so that we have uh, cloud rationalization, we have application rationalization, we have API publications and API um, uh, ability to use the APIs in a, in a, in a much more open way. That's um, really starting to help. Can today, not tomorrow. We need to sort of not just chase the next shiny thing and get too excited by things like AI, machine learning, and robotic. Actually, there's some fundamental uh, longer term uh, platforms, whether it's hosting of data, whether it's architecture, whether it's API um, uh, management. These are things that you know are not as sexy, but need to be done. But we need to keep um, uh, the excitement going and bring the organization with us. Changing culture is, um, is a real challenge. Uh, the op operating model will help that with breaking down those silos. Um, one of the challenges we have in, in defense is the, is the staff tend to move every two to three years. Um, and that doesn't help in terms of continuity. And again, industry are well placed because they lead these big change programs, these lead big procurement programs, and they can provide the continuity. It is about an end-to-end -end, uh, system um, and moving away from sort of you know, low scale, but very exciting point solutions that can be used in certain use cases to more industrial, scalable, general solutions that can be used across a number of platforms and across a number of scenarios um, is really important. And that's going back to the Army Design Authority and the data strategy and the digital backbone that we're working with Defense over. I've already mentioned digital talent and expertise and the use of reservists in this. Um, is really important. So the likes of Chris, um, fundamental from a cyber perspective, we also have a specialist uh, group called uh, the SGIS, Specialist Group Information Services, a team of about 120 reservists that all come from the IS IT environment. And they have been absolutely instrumental, both in working into defense, but also into the army, uh, helping us navigate the digital transformation. I currently have a team of eight architects from the SGIS team working to establish the Army Design Authority. They're currently doing a complete review of the strategic workforce planning for direct personnel to work out what is required from a systems and technology perspective to manage the Army's workforce. And again, industry can certainly help here as well, um, providing that external knowledge, but you know, civilian knowledge, you, reserve knowledge and the industry knowledge. Um, one thing I would say is those in the uniform are highly receptive to it and they, they realize that they need that input. And they also are fast learners and they've got some great resources in, in, in uniform already. So it's a real team effort and something that uh, I'm very, very encouraged by from what I'm seeing. Talking about team effort is partnering. Uh, you can't do it on your own and anyone who says they can provide end-to-end -end digital solutions uh, to an organization like the Army is, is, is not telling the truth. I mean, what you've got is this ecosystem approach. I mean, it's a large systems integration approach as well. Um, the role of the systems integrator will become more important. The role of the defense prime is changing to accommodate more of that systems integrator role. You know, there's so much bleeding out of the consumer technology space and the enterprise technology space that we need to adapt that quickly in the defense space. We can't allow and shouldn't allow defense primes just to provide their own solutions. We need a wider approach that is secure, but enables that collaboration to, to ensure that we are as competitive and efficient as possible. And the last point I would say, which probably makes a few of you smile who understands this, but in a, in a business transformation, digital transformation, is often everyone looks at the CTO in the uh, boardroom you know, and, or the CIO and goes, well, that's your responsibility. Uh, in the army, it's even more extreme because of your cap edge. You know, you're, you're not just the CIO or CTO, you're in the raw signals and that's what you do. You, you fix the communications and I'm gonna do everything else. Um, and I'm gonna focus on winning the war. The reality is it's everyone's business. 
And, uh, you know, focusing on data is as important as focusing on making sure you've got enough fuel for the tank and, and bullets for the guns. It's as, that is the reality that we are uh, embarking upon. That is the change of culture. Um, and I am very heartened to see, even within the last 18 months, that, you know, the Army and the Army headquarters in particular is uh, taking this programmatic and very enlightened approach under Project FEAR to the digital transformation of the British Army. Thank you, Mark. So, so Will's uh, background is, is a long career in the Army, um, in the Parachute Regiment and the Royal Irish Regiment. Um, he's also uh, served in staff roles on policy, plans, operations and exercise planning um, uh, in the Ministry of Defence and at all uh, levels from one star to four star, as well as NATO appointments. Uh, his last role was Assistant Chief of Staff Operations at the headquarters of the Rapid Reaction Corps in France. And he's now works as defence consultant on command and control, battle staff coaching and war gaming. So once again, somebody who's uh, well uh, equipped to talk about on the subject. So Will, over to you. Jeff, thanks very much. And thank you again to the Worshipful Company for this opportunity to uh, offer some thoughts on uh, digital transformation. Um, now, uh, Mark and I wanted to frame the digital, digital soldier in the context of contemporary and perhaps future warfare. So I'll offer some thoughts and then try to answer your questions. Now, warfare concerns the use of force or the threat of the use of force in pursuit of national and supranational aims. So uh, when we uh, talk about the modernization of the United Kingdom's armed forces, especially in the context of near peer high tech war fighting, we may need to recall Clausewitz's description of warfare as a realm of violence, uncertainty and chaos. Now, at the same time, sailor soldiers and airmen operate in an arena that is political, legal, ethical and moral and regulated, at least in part. And there is this notion of an ethic of reciprocity or having skin in the game. So um, while it's probably too late to prevent the weaponization of the Internet and the campaign to stop killer robots will prov prove futile, we can still reasonably ask how might digitization affect all this? Um, now, we live in an age of constant competition and hybrid warfare where actors seek to secure and sustain advantage and achieve political outcomes below the threshold of armed conflict. Now, the features of this so-called grey zone include disinformation of fake news, plausible or even implausible deniability, the hindrance of decision making across the full range of instruments of national power, the theft of intellectual property, lawfare, for example, manipulation of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, also involves co coercive diplomacy, ranging to the use of militias and non-military proxies, for example, fishing fleets in the South China Sea and little green men in Crimea and Ukraine. Now, arguably, these coercive activities Exploiting the thresholds of detection and attribution go beyond statecraft. Now, there's nothing particularly new in this. Uh, and indeed, the Russians claim that we in the West invented all this. In any case, the nature of post-Trump reality is that today's actors turn our very freedoms and availability of information against us. In the face of this, we must, of course, all educate and inform ourselves so that we can make better decisions. Now, we also need to ask ourselves, what is it actually that we're seeking to secure and defend and from whom or what? Is it security, sovereignty and prosperity? Is it values? Or is it freedom of access and movement across the global commons? The global commons is usually understood to refer not only to the sea and freedom of navigation, but also now to space and even cyberspace. But to my mind, we must now also extend the notion of global commons to the cognitive domain and virtual reality. Now, the difficulty um, is that while we are increasingly information led and interconnected, 
were also still deeply embedded in the industrial era. And a major implication of operating below the threshold of war is an increased emphasis on anticipating crises and generating tempo and being always ready to war fight. As the invoke concept, as Mark alluded to earlier, is multi-domain warfare and multi-domain integration. So um, multi-domain warfare um, integrates, seeks to integrate maritime, land and air operations, space and cyberspace, and at least acknowledges the uh, existence of the cognitive domain. Uh, the, the way we go about understanding this is we promote shared situational awareness by generating recognized pictures for each of these domains, plus an overarching common operating picture. This means that um, we can, perhaps must, link every shooter to every sensor in a seamlessly networked team, membership of which is a constant dynamic. And to uh, facilitate all this, uh, a few months ago, um, Defence announced their so-called digital backbone, uh, and Mark um, talked about this um, programme earlier. Now, an immediate concern of mine would be that COVID-19 uh, shows that addressing complex problems involves not just the whole of government, but the whole of society. How does Defence cooperate or integrate with non-digitised entities? Will standard protocols suffice? Um, so multi-domain uh, integration, digitization does offer the opportunity to connect sensors, deciders and effectors. And other phrases that are being bandied about include digital synchromesh and link satellites to soldiers, boots to bots and proxies to pixels. Um, so these are some of the phrases that um, you might um, uh, hear and care to understand. Now, in military terms, this enables a degree of standoff and shifts the emphasis from close to deep, where intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition, and reconnaissance assets cue long-range precision fires. And we can envisage swarms of unmanned aerial vehicles with land, space, and maritime versions the latter both on and beneath the surface of the sea. As a, a concrete example, um, the Royal United Services Institute, RUSI, um, in a paper uh, in 2019, described Russia's employment of artillery in Ukraine. Quote, in the early hours of 11 July 2014, the Ukrainian 24th Mechanized Brigade was maneuvering about 10 kilometers from the Russian border. Shortly after taking up positions, the Ukrainians found that their communications and navigation equipment was being interfered with. At around 4.20 a.m., they noticed UAVs apparently observing the column. Then the firing started. Approximately 40 salvos of Russian rockets struck the Ukrainians within a five minute period. The equipment of two battalions was destroyed. This incident, though far from isolated, sent a shiver of alarm through Western militaries for good reason. Um, now, um, two things um, stand out to me here. Firstly, this took place over seven years ago. And secondly, the actual destruction was of course affected by um, largely industrial era weapons. So, um, so what do we need now in order to get the best from digitization? Um, let's um, quickly uh, walk through a simple illustrative scenario. Um, government communications headquarters uh, picks up that a hostile country's leadership intends to attack a NATO ally. The Prime Minister decides something must be done and the government tasks the instruments of power accordingly. We keep an eye on who's doing what and coordinate with allies. Our space and air assets watch for possible hostile deployments, which need uh, in turn protection from hostile assets. And some of our assets are base at, based at sea. Ultimately, we will probably need to deploy combat forces on the ground of our own. And these will be supported by tactical uh, UAV swarms. We may need 
ultimately to signal our intent by physically destroying some of the now enemies, things and or people. Messaging our intent clearly to key actors who will then influence their deciders to change their ways. And the deciders' um, decisions are made in their minds. The cognitive domain is key. Uh, um, communications um, is critical uh, to this, as Mark has uh, explained, and this is pretty clear. But I think this also is um, a key vulnerability. And uh, communications is uh, a real potential weak link. Uh, and what worries me is that um, if someone exploded uh, a nuclear warhead high in the atmosphere, how, how would the electromagnetic pulse and ionization affect our ability to exploit information? And so again, we're still in the industrial era uh, and, and this is, uh, will affect everything we seek to do. Okay, so um, we were asked to talk about the digital soldier. So I should say something specifically about the land environment. Traditionally, the role of the infantry soldier was to close with and destroy the enemy by day and night, in any terrain, in any weather. Now, the digital soldier will want to draw on timely and fused information to support ground manoeuvre decision making and increase tempo. And the environmental information that absolutely must need to be digitized and made available must include terrain, uh, geo uh, mapping and meteo, the weather, um, but critically perhaps human terrain and cultural aspects and a translate capability so that we can understand and make ourselves understand to other people. And I, I would also note almost in passing the challenge of concealment which is becoming almost impossible. Do we need to hide in plain sight? And what about the urban or built environment? Uh, and when we uh, do fight, we fight in teams in the so-called all arms battle, where infantry, tanks, artillery, and engineers fight together, supported by other arms, such as aviation, helicopters, and fast air from the Royal Air Force. Now, in other words, there is this um, systems approach to fighting. And individual soldiers uh, are not just components of this system, but systems in themselves. And the development of the man-machine interface will see greater use of night visibility, augmented reality, shared situational awareness, smart weapons and smart weapon sites, health monitoring, the necessary power and data hubs, exoskeletons and navigation systems, whether GPS uh, or inertial. And digital soldiers will of course be integrated with their UAVs and UGVs. And throughout this, there must be a balance of the key characteristics of firepower, protection, mobility, and information. And communicating information needs bandwidth, reach and reliability. How do we provide a tactical cloud to our soldiers? What is the best mix of fixed and mobile infrastructure? If software is more important than hardware, when software becomes obsolete, can I update it remotely? Whilst it would be good to relieve the soldier of dull, dirty and dangerous tasks or situations, the likelihood is that soldiering at the sharp end will remain an environment of fear fatigue, stress, and exhaustion. And taking full account of human factors will remain paramount. The soldier must carry weapons and ammunition. These are very heavy. Electrical power for communications means batteries, which means yet more weight. So what about a wearable battery? Is my digitized equipment ruggedized? Is it quiet and readable, including at night? is using it intuitive when I'm frightened and tired. Now, um, while fighting is a critical activity, we can exploit data in other um, associated military activities. Uh, we can exploit data for education and training, uh, planning where data capture and analytics are important, visualization of the battle space, 
um, creation of a synthetic environment and virtual reality with digital models for mission preparation, mission rehearsal and war gaming. Now, during the execution of a mission, we've already spoken about um, shared situational awareness, including force tracking and the provision of a common operating picture. Additive manufacturing may offer opportunities. And then after the operation, uh, there is scope for detailed pace operational analysis, including um, at the political level. And I mentioned here um, Chilcott and his very useful um, uh, Ministry of Defence handbook that his team produced called The Good Operation. Um, now, um, optimising data exploitation, the soldier will need to be information literate. And the knowledge and skills that every soldier must develop will require upskilling, training and education. If I were one of these soldiers, the skeptic in me would want to know whose data, whose algorithms. I might even say, show me the algorithms, or at the very least, prove to me that they work on time, every time. And my, my last two points on this slide, information and uh, knowledge management, IKM, is uh, often overlooked, but is important. We need to understand what information we have, uh, how we get it, and how we get more and better. Uh, critically, all um, this digitization implies um, a change, uh, uh, actually, a, uh, potentially a very significant change in military culture, which is what I would like to address next. Now, adapting to technical change is largely a matter of training. Cultural change is more complex and more difficult. And whilst we may all have heard the term strategic corporal, the reality is that politicians hold the risk. The long-handled screwdriver is a reality and even desirable. Layers of military command and control, C2, do impose delay and can obfuscate. C2 is becoming more complex. Commander's decision-making encompasses more time and space and is becoming more collaborative. In the politico-military nexus of the kill web, we are likely to see even greater politicization of decision-making. We, we may also see a change in the relationship of the leader and the led. Soldiers have now arguably more and better education, certainly greater situational awareness and are on the spot. Now, we must note that there are unresolved contradictions in all this. Political and military permissions and authorities delegate decision-making, but to what level? Escalation can lead to miscalculation. We need fail-safe mechanisms to restore human control. Autonomy, whether human or machine, has its limitations. We will still need a command and control structure, optimized for responsiveness, with humans in the loop for legal, ethical, moral, and regulatory reasons. Um, just remembering our military traditions, to what extent do we need a new approach to train hard, fight easy? If training is required, it's too complex, I would argue. Ne new technology must be intuitive. But what about reversionary modes? The rifle and the tank are not dead, Traditional weapons are still very much with us and necessary. Armoured warfare remains a devastating weapon when combined with an effective deep battle. What of um, traditional soldiering skills, courage and leadership? Uh, and I think um, ultimately the, the real concern I would have is that machine learning, big data and the centralization of decision-making will tend to reduce human and individual agency including that of commanders and soldiers. And whose agency will fill this vacuum? Does data, the system, algorithms know better and take control? There are profound philosophical, political, legal, ethical and moral issues at stake affecting what we fight for and how. Now, a few uh, final thoughts here before um, we uh, come to question uh, and answers. Um, I just saw um, something that General Mark Milley said uh, only a few weeks ago um, with regard to Afghanistan. 
Um, and you can see here on the slide what he said. Uh, and um, it's an interesting perspective. So um, a few uh, final uh, thoughts then. Um, which is mightiest, the pen, the sword, or the digit? To what extent can digitization be made a game changer? In an era of constant competition and multi-domain warfare, what are our timescales and priorities? What about the cognitive domain? Can we afford to link every shooter to every sensor? Does history show us that there will be efficiency and affordability gains? How will digitization affect military culture? Who's in charge? Who decides who should be killed or threatened with force? And what remains of the real world and how much does it matter? Mm -hmm.